Come, you excited to be in God's house this morning, amen? Amen. Hey, I'm glad that you guys are here. I don't know if it's your first time or if you've been joining us in this series, I Don't Believe in Church, and it may sound like an awkward topic for me to, or an awkward title for a pastor to be preaching about, but we wanted to take a moment and just get real and honest about what do pe- why are people giving up on church? Why do people maybe make a similar statement, maybe not the exact statement, but a similar sentiment people are making? Because honestly, people don't have a problem with Jesus. They never had a problem with Jesus. So you know, like when we read the Bible and the, in the scriptures, no one really, the only people that had a problem with Jesus was the religious people, okay? Everyone else loved Jesus. He fed them when they were hungry. He healed them when they were sick. And nobody got a problem with Jesus. They got a problem with you. No, I'm just kidding. They got a problem with me. They got a problem with people, okay? So, so like, what, what are we doing, guys? What are we doing in the church that is somehow repelling, that isn't attracting like Jesus did, that isn't healing and feeding and loving? What are we doing? Let's just get real and honest about the challenges that people are seeing and having. And let's maybe just look at those and, and answer the question, how can we be different? How can we be the church that God designed, the church that Jesus was thinking about when he died for us, when he rose from the grave, the church that Jesus himself instituted? Because you guys do know, please, that the church is not an institution of man. It was created in the heart of God. It was created by Jesus. And so what we need to do is get back to that design. Let's get back to the original design of what does it mean to be the church? Come on, Brennan. Give it up for Pastor Brennan. Let's go. So here's a theme verse, 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, I'm writing. Now this again, this is Apostle Paul writing to a pastor named Timothy. And the the Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of your New Testament, for those of you who don't know. And the whole reason why he wrote these letters, and we have the Bible and the New Testament and the scriptures we read, is for the purpose of (laughs) a lot of them getting along with each other, or how to get along in God's family. Look what he says, I'm writing all these letters to you so that you know how to live in the family of God. And that family is the church. So, so we need to learn how to live in the church, how to live in a healthy way in the church. And if we could be really honest, and, and that's what we're doing in this series, okay, and hopefully every week we're doing that, just having an honest conversation. The church hasn't done a good job representing God's heart, has it? Not always. No, I'm not, I'm not here to, I'm just saying it has not always. We as disciples of Jesus And it can even just take it down to that level. How about us, just individually? We have not always been perfect at representing the heart of Jesus. And because of that, we've we've hurt people. And we've 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 brought things like you know judgment and hypocrisy and legalism and selfishness and self-righteousness and all these things that live within the heart of man. And therefore it lives, if it lives within the heart of man, then it's gonna live in his church. Do you guys see that? It's going to be here. It's here. It's here. It's us. It's us. It's us. It's all of us. So in this series, we've just been looking at it. So we looked at, we looked at hypocrisy, the number one complaint that people have against the church hypocrisy. And then we, last week, Pastor Brennan did an awesome job. Come on. Didn't he do an awesome job? <laughs> Pastor Brennan preached about, preached about judgment and, and judgmentalism and, 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 and what Jesus is really saying about judgment and how to judge well and not judge wrong and harshly. Today, I kind of want to broaden this out a little little bit, and I want to talk to you about this topic, church hurt. And this kind of envelops a lot of things, doesn't it? It envelops judgment and hypocrisy, but also pride and and that self-righteousness. This would envelop spiritual abuse, manipulation, toxicity. This 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 would envelop a lot of things, but if you've been in church for any amount of time, you probably have either heard this phrase, church hurt, or you have experienced some kind of hurt in these relationships within the church because we're all broken. We're all, can I, we, all, we're all have, we all have issues. Within this church, within every church in, in the entire world, are sinners saved by grace. And therefore, we are going to have all of our, our issues and baggage and pain and perceptions and, and all that stuff that, that we bring with us into the church. It's just it can end up boiling over and hurting people at times. And so some of you have been hurt by church. And 
may be hurt by church leaders, by church members, by church politics, by church traditions, and you've been hurt. Some of you have walked, like you walked in here today, and you can still feel the pain. You can remember it like it was like yesterday. And some of you, it wasn't that long ago, long ago, but for some of you, it was years ago that you were hurt in the context of Christian community, and it affected you so much. And it's one of the reasons why people today are maybe going, I just don't believe in that. And we're putting up walls and we're saying, no, 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 I just, I just can't get involved in that anymore. If that's what it's going to be about, and if that's what I'm going to open myself up to, then, then I'm, not, I'm not going there. And I want to I wanna tell you something, please hear me, that that, that would be the wrong choice. The most devastating thing that you could do, I'm telling you, you're playing into the hands of the enemy. Because the enemy wants you to believe that this is a church problem, and it's not a church problem. This is a sin problem. This is a people problem. This is, hey, can I, can I, this is a me problem. This is a you problem. This is one that we have, and here's what I, what I want to encourage you to do with this, con if you have any of this in your heart, if it's been a barrier, if it's been something that's divided you, if it's been something, a reason why you drifted or kind of, you don't serve anymore, you don't go to church that much anymore, you know, whatever that reason, if this has played any role in effect of you not belonging and connecting to a vibrant community of faith that Jesus calls his bride, his church, his body, here's what I want you to do, is just cross off church off of that statement. Because in all reality, this isn't a church issue. This is a people issue. It's just, hey, it's just hurt. Stop labeling it with the church. I understand it happened within the context of the community. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not minimizing that. And I understand even that there has been some, some disgusting, mean ugly things. And I mean, I've heard a lot of them with uh, people that have come to discovery just to heal and, 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 and balm on their wounds and just kind of just breathe, let God breathe on them a little bit. And so, so I understand that how ugly and nasty it can be, but please do not put a label on the bride of Jesus that she has hurt you because she didn't hurt you. The church did not hurt you. People let you down. People hurt me. People hurt you. And it's, it's, it's just hurt. So when you, it's like when you, in, in marriage, when you get hurt by your spouse, you don't go around saying your marriage hurt. Oh, I'm marriage hurt. You know? Or some of you got hurt by your boss or by your coworkers and the gossip and, and he yelled at you or he demeaned you or he demoted you or did something like that. You don't go around saying, I got business hurt. You know what? I'm not going to work anymore. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to work anymore because I'm work hurt. I'm work hurt. No, you don't give up on working because you got hurt at work. No, you gotta, you gotta figure that out. We have to, hey guys, we have to figure this out. This is something we gotta, we gotta figure out because, because yes, it happens and hurts happen. Sometimes the worst things done to you though can bring out the best in you. How many of you know that? When you respond the right way. Here's, here's what I do know, you guys. We can't change what we've experienced, but we can choose how the experiences change us. So I can't, I can't change what happened to you, what they said about you, what they did to you, the wrong that was done to you. Hey, the wrong you did to yourself. I can't change that. You can't change that. You can't change those experiences, but you can change how the experience shapes us. I mean, you know, people are gonna do stupid stuff. Anyone, anyone, anyone ever here done some stupid stuff? All right. Okay, hey, has anyone here ever hurt anybody? Will you just, can you be honest? I just want, I want those hands up and we'll keep them up. Has anyone here hurt anybody? Will you just look around in the room? Look around in the room. Just, will you look around at every single hand in the room and everyone else who's lying? I'm just kidding. <laughs> People hurt. Look, they hurt. They do mean things. We say mean things. We, and sometimes it can come from the people closest to us. Sometimes we hurt people the closest to us. Sometimes we hurt the people we love the most. And I think that's the, that's the challenge with the church is because we're, we think like, oh, they should know better. They should know better. I can take it from them. Out here, the people that don't know better, but, but I, just, ooh, I just can't handle it when they know better and they should. And we forget that we are sinners saved by grace and the people outside the church need the grace of God just as much as the people inside the church need the grace of God. 
And so today, I, I want to speak to this, but I want to speak to this from a context of, of not, just, not just church hurt, because it's just, it's just hurt. Now, if you've been church hurt, then you can apply it to that, that context. But every single one of you have been hurt, and you've allowed that hurt to define and shape your relationships in maybe a negative way. And so I want to speak to you today, whatever hurt that you have that has not been healed, that has not been brought to the cross of Jesus, has not got the touch of the master, has not been redeemed and forgiven and released. And I want to speak to any of those hurts that are holding you back from intimacy, from trust, from community, because acquiring an offense is going to keep you from seeing your own character flaws. Because blame is always deferred to another person. Anytime we have an offense in our heart and we put up the wall and we want to give up on, on the marriage and give up on that person or give up on church, it's, you're never going to grow. You'll never grow. Here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17. He said to his disciples, offenses will certainly come. How do you like that prophetic word from Jesus? Okay. One translation says, it is impossible that offenses won't come. So, so Jesus is saying, like, you're going to get offended. Hey, people are going to let you down. They're going to hurt you. They're going to say, they're going to do. And before you go, yeah, but those are those people. No, no, no. He says, be on your guard because if your brother. He's talking about those who are actually in Christ, those who belong to Jesus. He says, hey, they're not perfect. Be on your guard because they're going to let you down. They're even going to offend you. So if your brother does that and you got some offense going on, rebuke him. Let him know. Tell him. Don't, don't tell him behind his back. Tell him his fault. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you, he says, even seven times a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. I mean, you're holding on to that, and it's causing you to not step into community or step into the church or, or rebuild the intimacy of your marriage or whatever that hurt is. Jesus says you must. And here's, what, here's how the apostles responded. The apostles said, ow. Like, seven times a day, Jesus? But what if they didn't mean it? Like, what if, like, and, and, and I'm sure they're kind of, kind of thinking all these things in their head, and they go, they, they, the appropriate response of this was just, give me the faith to do that, Jesus. Because that's hard. What you're saying is, is hard, and can I just tell, relationships are hard. Healthy relationships are hard. A healthy marriage is hard. A healthy, healthy friendship is hard. Church is hard. Healthy church is hard. It's hard. We need to increase our faith, but oftentimes we don't respond the way that, that Jesus has told his disciples and us to respond. We respond in different ways because of the hurt. And some of you probably have responded in different ways because of the hurt, church hurt, whatever kind of hurt that you have. Let me give you some common responses, and you probably responded, you're in here today, and you've probably responded in one or more of these ways to your hurt. Write them down. Here's the first response. Some of you just decided to blow up. It's, it's, that's not the right, it's not blow up. So we get mad, we get angry, we take it into our own hands. We wanna, we wanna fight back. And you know what's, what's the, the hardest thing about this? It's not, the, it's not the one-time offenders, it's the repeat offenders. You know what I mean? It's the people that just keep on and keep on. The people that keep telling, the, the people that Jesus was talking about seven times a day, people. That's, that's, that's the hard part, man, that makes you want to just, you know, retaliate with a throat punch, okay? But <laughs> Romans chapter 12 tells us this. Don't hit back. Don't hit back. Well, you don't understand what they said. No, 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 don't hit back. But you don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what they said about me. You don't understand what they caused in my, in my life or my marriage or in my heart or in my whatever. Don't hit back, he says. Discover the beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. He says this, don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. It's not for you to figure it out. It's not for you to... to to cause, to retaliate, that's not yours. That's not yours. Not if you're in Christ, that's not yours. 
I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. So here's the bottom line. Do you trust God or not? Do you trust that God is going to take care of it? Do you trust that God is just? Is he just? Is he righteous and right? See, if we try to take matters in our own hands and try to solve it ourselves, you won't solve it at all. You blow up and you try to get even, you try to get revenge. And I think what we do is we squeeze God out of our situations and out of our, and some of you, you probably even felt like, man, I just can't sense God anymore. I don't sense his presence anymore. Maybe it's because you squeeze God out of your challenges by taking the problems into your own hands. You're trying to do it yourself, blowing up on people, retaliating, manipulating, figuring out yourself. Well, I'll just go over here then. And no, no. How about you just let God, let God, let God. Don't, don't blow up. Here's the second thing we try to do when we get hurt. And, and it's not, guess what? Hey, write down, because this is gossip. Write down gossip next to it, okay? It's not, can, guess what? Guess what I heard? Guess what she said? Guess, guess what he did? Can you, can you believe what this person, and, and man, I think the church can be the worst place for this. Church people can be so ugly, can be so gossipy, can be so, so, I mean, can cause discord toward each other, their spiritual leaders, and it's not God's way of handling the offense and the hurt. The scripture says this in Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse man stirs up dissension, right? He causes division and a gossip separates close friends. That's what happens when we, when we play the guess what attitude with our hurt. When we get hurt and we talk to this person and that person, here's, here's, hey, toxic people like this, they're masters at turning people against each other. But healed people are masters at turning people toward each other. Hey, be careful, be careful, man, because these toxic people, they, they'll, get your, they'll get in your ear and then eventually they'll get into your heart and shift it away from people. But healed people are masters at, hey, hurt people, hurt people, heal people, heal people. That's, that's what the scriptures tell us. Hurt people, hurt people, and heal people, heal people. You know the word gossip? Gossip means, it's this, in, the, in the Old Testament in Hebrew, the word gossip is, is murmuring and complaining. It's the same word, murmuring. It's what the Israelites did in the desert when they were wandering for 40 years. They murmured and complained against Moses. They, here's what they would do. They stand at their tent, and they would go, can you believe this guy? I've seen this rock 20 times, we're marching around. I think we're going in circles, guys. Can you, he needs to ask for directions already. And I can't, can you see these shoes? Look at these shoes. This manna is getting, over, I'm over it, I'm over it. And so they're just, they're just gossiping and complaining about Moses. And because of that, as a result of that, not one of them entered the promised land. Why? Because they were trying to solve their problem with a guess what attitude. They tried to solve their problem through venting their raw feelings and garbage on other people. And when you do that, it keeps us from living in all that God desires us. And I'm telling you, there's a better way to handle your hurt than by venting and, and gossiping. And Matthew 18, 15 says this, if another believer sins, again, is it, most of what the Bible is about is, is how to love each other, how to, how to make this work. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out that offense. You go to them privately, but sometimes we feel like, oh, I'm going to explode. And, and I, know it's, I know it's unhealthy to hold all that stuff in, so I just need to vent to somebody. I don't necessarily need advice. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I just need to get all this stuff out and express my feelings. Okay, but is that biblical? I understand like, like the, where that logic comes from, but is that kind of venting biblical? Now, now, don't get me wrong. There is a place to like vent in, 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 in a sense of like, there is a time for us to unload, like to, to let someone else care for us, to know really what's going on. Hey, this is really what's happening. Invite people to carry a burden with us. But when your venting stops being, inviting someone to help me carry a burden and recruiting somebody against another person, you have stepped into betrayal and gossip. Out your amen, somebody. Come on. Let me show you in Proverbs. There's in the wisdom writings. These aren't in your outline or anything. Uh, but check them out. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11. It says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. Like just say, lets it loose. Just lets it loose without, without consideration, without faith, without thought, without filter. 
A fool gives full vent to his anger, to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. That's what wisdom does. Wisdom, wisdom thinks about what they say before they say it. Go figure that. Proverbs 18 and 2 says this, that a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. So I don't care what you think. I don't really, I just want, I just want to be heard. I just want to express my opinion. And I'm telling you, you say, well, I don't know if this is that bad. Why is it that bad? Because people aren't your refuge. That's why. People are not your refuge. They cannot handle your junk. And when you do that, when you vent to other people like this and you have this guess what attitude and you're handling your hurt by trying to recruit people to see it the way you see it, you're creating bonds based on aggression. And you, you will always have, you'll always have a toxicity in that relationship as long as you vent to that person. They were never meant to handle that toxicity of you dumping all that stuff. Venting never accomplishes what you want it to accomplish. So what do you do? When you feel like you're gonna explode, you gotta express your feelings, your hurt, your anger, your anxious. You don't have to let your emotions bubble up your, your, and express them like in this raw, unfiltered way. No, the Bible says cast all your anxieties on the Lord because he cares for you. It's like, like, don't vent to people, vent to God. I mean, you read the Psalms, that's what David did. David cried out to God. He vented to God, and God did something miraculous in our heart. So, so it's not, hey, when you get hurt, and if you've been hurt, it's not the guess what attitude. Stop playing the guess what game. Here's another way that we respond, and it's, it's not so what. Oh, so what? It's no big deal. Oh, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. We minimize it. Well, you know, they didn't really mean it. It's not a big deal. Um, here's the deal with that. When you minimize the offense, you cheapen the forgiveness. When you minimize the offense, you cheapen the forgiveness because it's, if it's not that big a deal, you really don't need to forgive anyone. So you just bottle that up, you swallow it down, and you cheapen or even rob yourself of the maturation and the, the growth that, that, that can show up in you and, and being achieved by forgiving other people. So we do things like this Jeremiah scripture in Jeremiah 6 and 14. He says, my people are broken. They're shattered. And they put on Band-Aids. Isn't that what we try to do? We try to act like it's not that bad. We just put a Band-Aid over a broken issue, a broken heart, saying it's not that bad. You'll be just fine. But things aren't just fine. They're not just fine. And we, when we minimize it, we act like it's no big deal. But I'm going to submit to you that it hurts and impacts our lives. And some things have attached themselves to our very souls. Things that we try to act like don't hurt. Things that we try to put a Band-Aid on and keep moving. And maybe even good intentions. You had good intentions about it. It's not that big of a deal, but you even said, oh, I'll just be the bigger person. But it was a big deal. And you need to heal. That Band-Aid's not going to work. Here's a truth. You may want to write this down. If healing hasn't been worked out and forgiveness hasn't been walked out, then chaos is what's going to continue to play out. You can't act like it's not there. You, got, you, you have to heal, you have to forgive, or else you're going to get more of the same result. Here's a scripture that Pastor Brennan read last week, Hebrews chapter 12, 15. He says, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their lives. And many of us have got this bitter root. Well, I don't know why I get so mad all the time and blow up all the time. I don't know why I self-destruct in my relationships. Could it be that there's some toxins in your life that you haven't uprooted? some things that you have not dealt with in your life. Here's another one. Where some of you may be today is, is simply this. It's not give up. And some of you have been there, or maybe you've, you're, you've already given up on church, or you're ready to give up on church, or maybe you're ready to give up on that marriage, give up on that friend, give up on that relationship because of that offense. And now there is, there is a time that we need to cut people off. Can I just get, there is a time where things, where people are so destructive and toxic. There is even, oh, I hesitate to say this because there is even some, some churches and leaders that are manipulative and toxic and, and there are some businesses that are, there, there absolutely are. And there are times where you need to set some boundaries and you may even need to cut some people off. Sometimes you need to give up on somebody. And, and if you've never heard a pastor say that, Go read the Gospels again because Jesus let people walk to, he let people walk away and he actually walked away from people. There were times where Jesus let people, he didn't go chasing after everybody. He actually gave them the truth and let them walk away if they didn't receive it. 
And there were times where actually Jesus walked away from people. He, he walked away when they were ready to kill him before his time. They wanted to stone him, and he actually just, he walks away from their religious persecution. There are times when you need to give up on somebody, where you need to cut the cord. They're holding on to the rope on a bridge saying, hold me, hold me, please. There are some times where you just go, you better climb up or I'm letting go. Come on, amen, somebody. Okay, okay. But I, I hesitate on saying that because I think that a lot of us, uh, sometimes we just want to escape from people, escape from marriage, escape from church, escape from a difficult conversation, escape from the healing, escape from the conflict and the tension and, and the difficulty that it is to produce a healthy marriage or a healthy church or healthy relationships. And it's just easier to let go of the rope. It's easier to just cut the, it's easier to just say, I'm just not, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I just don't believe in church. It's a lot easier to say that. It's a lot easier. Hebrews, <laughs> but aren't you thankful that God never gave up on you? I'm thankful that God never gave up on me. Hebrews 12, 3 says this. Think of what he went through, how he put up with some, so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. Don't, get, don't let yourself come to that place because of the persecution, the evil. So how should we respond? Offenses are going to happen. But what is God's way of handling the hurts that we experience from people in our relationships, from handling those offenses, can I tell you very plainly, here, write this down. It's grow up. It's not give up. <laughs> it's grow up. It's not blow up. It's grow up. It's not so what. It's grow up. When you don't deal with the hurt, when you bury it, when you move on, when you adjust your your new normal so that it'll never happen again, whatever that is, that unhealed hurt stunts your growth. They, they, they actually revealed this um, biologically, scientifically, medically, that when a child has a traumatic experience, has a hurt, has a, a, you know, a neglect, an exposure to violence, a lack of attachment even, uh, affects the structure and the chemistry of their brain so that they physically don't even mature at the rate of a normal human being. That their brain does not grow and mature because of the hurt that they had that was never addressed and healed. And, and I want to submit to you today that, that if you don't decide to deal with this hurt and you continue to let it affect your decisions and adjusting your life around the pain instead of dealing with the pain, then you are stunting your growth. Then your spirit, your emotions, your mind, your soul is paused in that time of the pain. That's why you can have someone who's a 50-year-old man who acts like a 13-year-old child because the pain their daddy did to him. Ephesians 4 tells us plainly, Instead, hey, instead of so what, instead of giving up, instead of playing into the hand of the enemy to, to, to divide the brothers and the sisters in Christ, instead of playing into all that junk, speak the truth in a spirit of love. I'm going to talk about that. We talked about grace and truth a lot in the series. I'm going to talk about it again. Speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under, he says, his control. Under whose control? Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together. So what is he talking about? He's not just talking about us growing up individually. He's talking about us growing up together as the body of Christ. And we need to grow up. And we need to grow up together. We need to figure this out. And the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So here, let me um, submit to you today the three ingredients for growth. This is, I have the feelings in your handout, but not that statement. You may want to write that down. If you want to grow and if you want to heal, if you want to get beyond this thing, you need three ingredients. Three ingredients to grow. Write them down. Grace, truth, and time. This is, this is how God heals, how God redeems, how God delivers, how God restores every hurt, every offense, every broken thing in your life, in your mind, in your heart needs grace, truth, 
and time. Let me talk about this real quick, okay? Because we actually have explained this a little bit throughout this entire series. Let me hit on it a little bit deeper. Grace is the unmerited favor of God toward people. Grace is something we haven't earned and we don't deserve. Grace is unconditional love and acceptance. It's this kind of love. It's this kind of grace that is the foundation of healing for every human ailment. Grace, unconditional grace, is the the first ingredient, necessary ingredient for healing to take place, for growing up in the image of God to take place. Grace is unbroken, uninterrupted, unearned, accepting relationships. That's what we need. We need grace, but we also need truth. Truth is the second ingredient for growing up in the image of God, for growing up in the body of Christ. Truth is what is real. Truth describes things how they really all are. Grace is the relational character of God, but truth is the structural aspect of God. Truth is the skeleton that life hangs on. It adds shape to everything in the universe. God's truth leads us to what is real, to what is accurate. In order to heal and in order to grow, you need the grace of God. You need the truth of God. You need to know what is real and what is true in your life for it to grow. You need God's grace. You need truth, but you also need time. We don't talk about this a lot, do we? Time. We give our life to Christ. We say, oh, there we go. Ooh, I'm good to go now. No, no, no. Grace, truth over time. How many know that, that forgiveness is a choice, but it's also a process? How many know forgiveness takes time? Anybody know that? Forgiveness takes time. Forgiveness, you can immediately choose that, but it then is constantly a choice every day after that. It is both an immediate, salvation is immediate, but it's also walked out over time. So in the moment you give your life to Christ, it is It is done, immediately received, but constantly walked out. Forgiveness is both immediately given, but constantly walked out. It takes time. But what you need to know about time is that there is good time and bad time. Some of you, you know what bad time is? Bad time is is when it only gets worse, and you sit on it, and stew on it, and spew on it, and just, oh, and you just, I just can't, if I see his face, if I see his face, okay, it's, there's some, there is, time does not heal all wounds, it's time under grace and truth. Ah, did you grab that? Time does not heal all wounds, it's time under grace and truth, because it takes time, it takes time to redeem things, it's take, it takes time, think back in the garden, in the garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve, can I just theology with you guys real quick, can he explain this, how, how grace and truth works over time? Because you can see this all throughout the scriptures. And if you understand this, you're going to see not only your life, but the Bible shape out a lot differently as you read the stories. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, before the fall of man and the sin that was found in their heart, they existed outside of time. They existed in eternity. They, they, there was no sickness, illness. They did not age. Every species was brought to them at their... hey. Uh, so if you ever, does the chicken or the egg come first? The chicken came first, okay? They just, they're just, that's what happened. There was, just, everything, there was no time, there was no aging, there was no death, there was no sickness, there was no none of that. They existed in eternity, and when they sinned, the effects of sin started to take place. And so what God did was, was he removed them from the Garden of Eden. And this removal from the Garden of Eden was a removal of eternity into good time. See, because they had sin that needed to be worked out, they needed the time to work it out. Sin cannot be worked out in eternity. Your problems and our issues and our brokenness cannot be worked out in eternity. It was actually part of God's grace to take them out of eternity and put them in time. Because redemption takes time. Redeeming takes time. Forgiveness takes time takes time. And whenever you are stuck in the past or you are, you're, you're, and you're hurt and you got issues and you got offenses and you're thinking about that stuff in the past or even you're worried about stuff in the future, listen, 
you're not living in good time. You're not living in the present time. You're not living in the redeemed time under grace and truth where God can touch and heal and restore those things and make you more like him. You're not living in it. You're, and this is why the enemy, the enemy is so good at just reminding you of your faults and your issues and their faults and their issues. And he gets you, gets you thinking about that stuff because if he can get you living in the past or living in the future, then he can, he can remo- remove you from the effects of grace and truth in your life. So when you don't deal with the hurt, listen, and you're living, and some of you have been living in that past for too long, and you've been stewing on that thing. You haven't let God heal it and produce something good out of it and, and, and moved forward through it. Because of that, grace and truth. At the moment you made that decision, you removed yourself from good time, and grace and truth has no effect in your life. Are you seeing this today, you guys? Okay. So this is, this is, so how do we, how do we deal with it? How do we deal? How do we be what I'm calling a church that heals? How can we be a church, man, that, that is life-giving, that, that brings healing? Yes, there's going to be hurts, man, but we want to be known for who we heal, not who we hurt. Amen, somebody? How do we do that? And I gotta, I'm going to have to flow through this backside, so I'm going I'm to really quickly give you guys. How do we be a church that heals? Number one, add value to people. Add value. You're either adding value to people or you're wanting people to add value to you. So which one is it? You're either adding or subtracting. If you're adding value to people, it's intentional. But if you're subtracting value from people, it's always unintentional. It always is. Um, You can spend your life connecting or correcting people. Connecting with people or correcting people. And if you value them, you'll connect with them. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt. Jesus says, look, you are the additive value to life, to people. That's what I, that's what Jesus called you. Like you're supposed to go around adding value to, can you imagine if this was a place where everybody was not focused on what they can get out of it, but how they can give value to every person? Wouldn't that be a church? I want to be at that church seven days a week if I was just, if I knew that everyone was going to add value to everybody, not come into this place thinking, what am I going to get out of it? And I'm telling you, so much of life is taking and taking and taking and subtracting from us. You know, it takes five to seven positive words of affirmation to properly metabolize one negative word. One negative word, that the end, one lie of the enemy, one, one messed up conversation with a friend or, or spouse or whatever it is. It takes five to seven positive words of affirmation. Add, if you want to be a church that heals, add value to people. You know how you add value to people? By serving them. Serve people. Serve people. Number two, build intentional community. And the key word is intentional. Like, like are you intentional about the people that you're, you have around you, that you are walking with? And, in a, in, and so, can you pray with them? Can you study the word of God with them? Can you, can you care for them and they care for you? Like, build intentional community. Community, the way we do that here at Discovery, you guys know, is through small groups. Not just here in this large, group, in this large gathering. No, if you want to be a church that heals, you got to get connected to intentional community. Again, let's not build a church according to our designs. Let's get God's design for the church and be that. Here's Acts chapter 2. What does is, what is God's church look like? The early church, the first church. They worship together regularly in the temple. So at church, they worship regularly. So glad you're here. Great. We're going to worship together. But they also met where? In small groups, in homes. So let's get back. Let's get back to the design. Stop treating church like a Sunday thing and build intentional community. Number three, number three, keep short accounts. Some of you got a long record log of the hurts and the offenses and the wrongs that were done to you. Listen to me. Let God be God and let humans be human. Humans are broken. Humans are messed up. We all are. Let humans be humans. Ephesians 4.26 tells us, don't let the sun go down while you're still holding on to that thing. Hey, deal with that quickly. Deal with that quickly. Now listen, forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the, of the offense. It's not doing that. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation. That's not what forgiveness is. It doesn't mean that I, I reconcile. Like I said, sometimes you need to set a boundary. Sometimes you need to redefine a relationship. Sometimes if there is abuse and things like that, you need to get out under that thing. Get away from that thing. Sometimes you need to. Forgiveness isn't forgetting what happened. 
But listen to me, I'm tired of this toxic culture canceling people when we should be reconciling with people. Come on, let the church be different, you guys. Let's go first. Let's stop cutting people off and canceling people because of their brokenness and start connecting with people because of their brokenness. Let it lead with us. We should be the ones who are leading the way in this. Leading the way of laying down our pride and, and laying down our issues and laying down our, our right to be right and saying, I love you anyway. I love you regardless. And I'm your brother regardless. And you're my sister regardless. Keep short accounts. Forgiveness isn't fair. And trust me, you don't want fair. Thank goodness God's not fair. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want fair. I want forgiveness. <laughs> I don't want God to be fair with me because if God was fair to me, I would get hell and punishment. I'd have to take the punishment. Every word that was said, every action that was done, every wrong. I've... But thank God he didn't give me what was fair. He gave me forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't want what's fair. I want forgiveness. That's what God has called us to give. Not fair. Forgiveness. Matthew 6 tells us this. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, he says, if you don't forgive others their sins, if you're going to hold on to that, if you're not going to deal with it, if you're not going to heal from it and forgive it and let it go and come back to the body of Christ and lay down your pride, your Father is not going to forgive you. Hey, it's unforgivable not to forgive. It's unforgivable not to forgive. What if they're still toxic, though? What if they're still being hurtful, though? What if they don't change? Hey, my ability to heal cannot be conditional on them wanting my forgiveness, but only on my willingness to give it. Hey, you don't forgive them for their healing. You forgive them for yours. Okay, so what? Keep short accounts. Number four, share your struggles. You want to be a church that heals? Do we want this to be a life-giving place where people come alive and healing takes place? Well, get real. Get honest. Give up, be vulnerable about it. Here's the, here's the deal. Like we're all, we love and want vulnerability and brokenness. We want to. We want to, we want to be who we really are. Take off the mask and just, we want to be vulnerable and broken, but what comes after is the process of getting better. Hey, sometimes, I understand sometimes church hurts, but sometimes, sometimes you need to be hurt. Sometimes truth hurts. Sometimes accountability hurts. And I'm telling you, it's always going to be in grace and truth, but, but because I love you and because I'm going to be a good pastor to you, I'm going to hurt you. And if the shoe fits, you wear it, but I love you. There's going to be grace. I love you, and I will never give up on you. But I'm going to give you the truth. I'm going to give you the, the truth of God's word. But we need that. Healing, it needs that. If we're going to be a church that heals, we've got to get honest about our struggles. James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. This is God's way of bringing healing into our life. God cannot heal what you do not reveal. We have to get to a place where, where you admit it, where you, and it's the healing problem. I'm telling you, like when you go to celebrate recovery and someone goes, oh, uh, my, name is, my name is Jason and I'm an alcoholic and I've, I've dealt with this and I've been clean for this long. What they say is, glad you're here, Jason. No, I'm not, I'm not in celebrate recovery. I'm just being an example, okay? But, but they don't go, oh, I can't believe you did that. No, they, they, they lay down the judgment and the condemnation and that accepting, that grace that is unconditional love and accepting is the foundation that is necessary for healing. So when someone shares their struggles with you, don't give them truth. Give them grace. If someone hides their struggles from you, give them truth and then grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul showed us this. He led the way. He said, my friends, ah, I want you to know what a hard time we had in Asia. This is the apostle Paul getting vulnerable, getting honest, getting real. Our sufferings were so horrible and so unbearable that I thought we were going to die. I was, I, I was at the end of my rope. Paul is a great example, again, of being vulnerable, of being honest, about it being okay to share your struggles because every one of us struggle. If the Apostle Paul struggles, if Jesus struggled, we're all going to struggle. And then number five, number five, connect to Jesus. Hey, you want to be a church that heals? Then, then 
It's not just about connecting you to a church service. It's not about just connecting you to a group. It's about connecting you to the only person that can heal you. Connecting to Jesus. It's so important, church, that we get this right. This is so important that we get this right. To be the church that God has called us to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 tells us this. That we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal. Hey, he's making it through us. Like, like it's, this is why it's so important for us to get this right. Because God is making his appeal to mankind through you. Through us. Through our relationship. Through our unity. Through our love. Through our peace. Through our humility. God is making his appeal. I love what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm going to close with this thought. Now he uses us too. You know God wants to use you. He wants to use you as a demonstration of his peace, his grace, his love, his forgiveness. Now God uses us too to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. He says our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But check this out. But this fragrance is perceived differently. It's, it's just, it's looked at differently by those who are, look at it, who are under grace and truth in time, who are in the process of being saved who, by grace and truth, who are in, who are under grace, who are being saved than by those who are in bad time, who are perishing, who are holding on to their hurt and their issue, and their offense. They're, the decay of the fall is having an effect, not grace and truth. See, how you perceive the word of God, how you perceive the revelation, how you perceive the truth of God's word depends, actually, your perception of it depends if you are in good time or bad time. Are you being saved? Or are you perishing? And some of you today, you're perishing little by little. You know Jesus. You know the truth, but you're not living under grace and truth because that offense and that hurt has caused you to run away from God, run away from community, run away from your church. You are literally becoming worse and worse, and you know it. Your attitude, worse and worse, and you know it. And what I want to encourage you to do is to not give the enemy the room anymore. It's not play into the hand of the devil anymore to bring division and to be a church that heals and lead the way in reconciliation. Amen, church? Can I, can I pray for you? Every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. God, I just thank you for bringing healing to your church, restoration to your church, reconciliation to your church. No longer are we gonna allow the lies of the enemy to keep us from belonging and connecting, to keep us out of the redeeming time of grace and truth. Help us, God, to walk in grace and truth with every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and maybe you, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Maybe you haven't received the grace of God, like a fresh start. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. That's all that's waiting right now. For some of you need to make that decision for the first time and some of you need to make it again. And I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or anything, but I want to pray for you right where you're seated. Come on, if that's you, I'm going to count to three right now. And I just want you to lift up your hand if you're ready for a fresh start today. Come on, one, two, three. Lift up that hand and lift it high. Come on, be bold. Keep it up, keep it up. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I need you, God. I surrender, God. Yes, yes. I'm coming back, God. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All over this place back here too. Thank you, God. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this right there in your heart? Just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for projecting on others and on you. Today, I surrender the control of my life and I declare that you're my Lord, my Savior. Come live inside of me. Make me brand new. Change me from the inside out. God, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise if you receive that word today. Amen. Amen.